Welcome, everyone. Thanks for joining us this evening. We're going to get started if you come and take your seats. And for our finalist, we have some seats reserved for you up front. So if you'd like to come and take your seat up here. Wonderful. Well, good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Better Government Association's 2023 Richard H. Driehaus Foundation Awards for Investigative Reporting, Untangling the Truth. It's great to see you all here tonight. For Illinois journalists, winning a Driehaus Award provides career-affirming recognition, and this year's awards will be no different. My name is Sydney King. I have been an investigative reporter at the Illinois Answers Project, the recently renamed journalism arm of the Better Government Association for a little over two years. Tonight's event marks both the 19th edition of the Driehaus Awards and the public launch of the Better Government Association's 100th anniversary. So a little bit about the BGA. The BGA came to life during the Prohibition era. Alcohol was illegal, yet more than 5,000 Chicago taverns and speakeasies thrived. Not much of a surprise for this city. City aldermen who won their votes through fraud and ballot box stuffing, ran illegal gambling houses and brothels. Chicago Mayor William Big Bill Thompson, known as one of the worst mayors of any major city in the country's history, was openly in cahoots with the infamous Al Capone mob. Angered, frustrated, and exhausted with rampant corruption, a group of clergy, business leaders and journalists came together to form the Better Government Association to counter the misdeeds of public officials. For a century now, the BGA has produced data-driven investigative journalism, advocated for government reform, defended access to public information, and mobilized people to demand better from their government. Tonight's finalists, demonstrate journalism's power to illuminate government overreach and highlight that corrective actions must be taken to prevent repeat offenses. Tonight is a celebration that captures the spirit of the awards and its namesake, Richard H. Driehaus. His support of investigative journalism has made an indelible impact on the lives of residents across Chicago and Illinois. And the BGA has been honored by the responsibility to reward and encourage investigative reporting by our colleagues from news organizations across Illinois. Since the inception of the Driehaus Awards, we have received more than 400 submissions and honored more than 90 investigations. In addition, yeah, give it up. In addition to honoring the work of a wide array of newsrooms, big and small, we also will listen to a compelling conversation between BGA President David Grising and Pulitzer Prize winning New York Times reporter and co-author of the book She Said, Megan Toohey. After their conversation, we will welcome Nick Burt of the Richard H. Driehaus Foundation to the podium to announce this year's Driehaus Award winners. So let's get on with the show. It is my distinct honor to introduce the BGA's president and CEO, David Grising. Would you give a vote? David joined the BGA in 2018 after a career that included stints at the Chicago Tribune and sometimes 
as well as regional bureaus of national and global news organizations. While leading the VGA's successful efforts to uncover public corruption, waste, and fraud from the city to the suburbs and in Springfield, David has also become a leading voice on good government issues through his regular columns in the Chicago Tribune and as a guest on local radio and television programs. Would you all help me welcome our president, David Grising. Thank you very much, Sydney. It's wonderful to have Sydney at the podium this evening. Uh, she and her Illinois Answers colleagues represent the next generation of investigative reporters. It's a curious, focused group committed to fact-based reporting. They demand answers from government officials and are providing answers to some of society's biggest problems through their solutions journalism. Looking across the room, I see many similar-minded journalists. How fortunate for Chicago in our field that so many of us are doing this important work, and we are honored that you came here tonight. <laughs> Chicago has always been a great town for reporters. Now is no different. In February, I attended the Knight Foundation Media Forum. It's an annual conference in which nonprofit journalism enterprises gather with funders and other industry leaders. I learned that everyone is looking at what we here in Chicago are doing. With commercial newspapers waning and audiences for broadcast news shrinking, the public is looking, looking for trustworthy, factual reporting for news sources. That's where we, many of the reporters in this room, come in. We are getting this critically important work done digitally, in print, through broadcast, and through streaming. Tonight, we will be honoring some ambitious and powerful feats of such journalism. The reporters in this room are making a difference and an impact. We can't do it alone. We depend on our readers and members and subscribers, and also the commitment of donors, foundations, and individu individuals who understand the importance of great journalism and are willing to fund it. Richard Reedhaus was one such person. For more than 25 years until he died in 2021, Richard supported data-driven journalism by the BGA and other publishers. He cared about the city and our state. He also was an innovator, and he admired innovation wherever he saw it. That's one reason that just last month, his foundation made a transformative gift in Richard's honor to enable the BGA's Illinois Answers Project to launch a new partnership model that we call our Embed Strategy. It is designed to pair investigative and solutions journalism expertise from the Illinois Answers Project with the local market knowledge of newsrooms across Illinois. We'll provide reporters and an editor dedicated to reporting stories of relevance to local communities and build through that an actual statewide report. Funding from the Driehaus Foundation will make all of this possible and I'm pleased to say that a number of our new colleagues are here tonight. Will you please be recognized? <laughs> this afternoon, Ronnie Ramos, the Editor-in-Chief of Illinois Answers, met with all these partners to begin to execute the strategy. You'll begin seeing the initial reports emerging from this new integrated partnership effort later this year. We are grateful to the Driehaus Foundation for investing in this revolutionary concept and for creating the forum that brings all of us out to celebrate and honor great journalism. Thank you, David. Today, it is our privilege to listen in as two experienced journalists discuss the ins and outs of investigative reporting. Megan Tuohy is a pioneer in our industry and rightfully the subject of much acclaim. Her reporting on abuse of power, sexual misconduct, and victim silencing has aided in creating a journalistic world where the words of women hold new weight in our society's belief system. Since her days as a reporter here in Chicago, Tuohy's career is marked by a demonstrated commitment to exposing power structures 
that mishandle the vulnerabilities of those at the very bottom. Whether it's rape kits gone untested by Chicago area police departments, underground networks abandoning adopted children, or most notably, her award-winning work uncovering numerous dozens sexual mis misconduct allegations against Harvey Weinstein, Tui's work has had real life quantifiable impact. But as a young journalist, what I find to be a particular strength of her reporting is Tui's capacity to honor the honesty of survivors sharing the most delicate aspects of their life stories while sustaining a journalistic integrity that has absolutely bulldozed the systems which uphold the misdeeds of billionaires and presidents alike. Would you please join me in welcoming in conversation with our president, David Grising, Pulitzer Prize winning reporter, Megan Tuohy. Thank you very much, Sydney. A well-earned introduction. I should come home more often. <laughs> Can I bottle that, those yeah. kind words and bring them back with me? Really that was great. Touching. Really appreciate it. Um, Louis C.K., Charlie Rose, Matt Lauer, Mario Batali, James Levine. Facebook, Tesla, Amazon, CBS, Goldman Sachs, Disney, Fox. If that first list of names gave you a little bit of the creeps, and that second list of names made you feel like something unusual is happening in this country right now, it's due in part to the work of Megan Tui and her reporting partner, Jody Cantor, and some other great journalists at the Times who yeah. supported that work. And after reading your book and watching the movie about you, uh, the most striking moment that comes to mind for me is that call that happened actually a half hour past deadline. Harvey Weinstein had a half, he was supposed to have called by one o'clock with his statement, and the phone didn't ring till about 1.33, according to the recording you apparently made. So tell us a little bit about that. Right, that last yeah. call before you published. This was really the sort of do or die moment as we were finally preparing to go to, pu to publish um, the, our, I guess at that point, four or five month investigation of him. And you know, the last part of uh, reporting and telling these stories, as you guys all know, involves going to the subject and spelling out everything that you're preparing to publish about them, to put in print and giving them a chance to respond. And you know, you do that in the name of accuracy and in the name of fairness. And um, normally, I mean, if you're dealing with a powerful subject, whether it's kind of government, you know, political figures or powerful companies, that's always a little bit of the moment where you're debating how much time do we give them? And it, it, it inevitably inspires <laughs> nervousness uh, and anxiousness uh, on the part of the journalists. But, and in this case, we had had a lot of hand wringing because not only was this a powerful individual, but it was somebody who had gone to great lengths to stop our story. Um, and we really couldn't put anything past him. You know, he, we'd come to find out, had hired these private investigators to trail us and our sources and try to dupe us. They'd been promised $300,000 if they could stop us. He had brought, you know, he had assembled a powerful team of, of lawyers, um, including some surprising figures like the feminist lawyer, the feminist lawyer, Lisa Bloom, who, were, who was by his side, and Charles Harder, who, as you know, had successfully sued Gawker out of existence you know, th uh, threatening us with lawsuits. And so we, we knew that there was gonna be sort of shenanigans on his part. And so in these final moments, we, we ultimately, I can't remember if we gave him days. Uh, I think we ended up we giving him two days. Two days, we gave yeah. him two days because we figured that, that hopefully that could have contained all the potential damage and harm and threats and other manipulations that he was sure to try. 
uh, in that final stretch as he so desperately tried to stop us. And so it was a complete roller coaster. Uh, we had you know, the threats of lawsuits. At one point, he barged into the New York Times uninvited with lawyers by his side, which is depicted in the movie. You know, I led them into a conference room and told them they had 10 minutes to talk, not a minute more. Uh, and then, sure enough, but ultimately, you know, the deadline is approaching. You've got until 1 o'clock on Thursday, and then we're pressing the publish button. And so still, in those final, you know, that final hour, we were getting messages from Lanny Davis, the crisis PR guy that he had hired, um, who was pretty out of his league at that point. We had um, people sending statements, and, but ultimately, we needed to make sure we couldn't publish this unless we could say, you know, truthfully that we had given him, that he had had his chance to respond. And if he was going to pass that up, that was fine. So at 1.30, we finally got on the phone with him. And at this point, we had had several conversations with him. And, you know, not surprisingly, it proved to be as dramatic as every other uh, encounter we had had. You know, he was swinging back and forth between sort of threats and flattery and, but, as you guys all know, when you've got the goods, at that point we had the facts, we had you know, this long trail of secret settlements that he had paid, we had documents, and we had two women on the record. And so there was no place less, left for him to hide, so you could hear him. I mean, this was, the, the movie very accurately depicted this final phone call uh, where he's on conference call with me and Jody and our editor, Rebecca, and Dean Bacay, the executive editor, just kind of storms in because, and eventually says, Harvey, time's up, you know, like give, mm -hmm. give, give the reporters a comment, uh, I, I'm leaving. Right, and D, D. Bacay, his handling of this story was interesting, he just plugged in here and there, but it was yeah. always really in, instrumental making key decisions, and in this case, telling Harvey, hey, put up our shut up, it, really, yeah, it did exactly. seem to shut him up, didn't it? Exactly, yeah. no, it was yeah. one of my favorite moments to just have you know, and, and obviously there had been, in reporting the story, we had talked to people who had actually talked to other reporters. There were other journalists who had, had tried to do this story, and we kept hearing, like, listen, Harvey Weinstein's going to barge into the New York Times. Um, he's going to go straight to, you know, the Salzburger, he's the publisher. He's going to go to Dean, the executive editor, and he's going to kill this story. That's how powerful he is. And it was the exact opposite. I mean, in fact, we, wor we worried about what was going to happen if we, if we weren't able to bring it over the finish line. You know, our, they, we had so much support all the way up through the top. Right, right. So um, what I'd like you to do, just in case people haven't been following along at home, uh, just read, let, let's, I'll fold it right here. Read the, read the top few paragraphs of that story. Okay. This is what you were fighting, arm wrestling with Harvey Weinstein right. over. Yeah. Day one story of what proved to be a multi-part series. Right, yeah, so it said, uh, two decades ago, the Hollywood producer Harvey Weinstein invited Ashley Judd to the peninsula of the Beverly Hills Hotel for what the young actress expected to be a business breakfast meeting. Instead, he had her sent up to his room where he appeared in a bathrobe and asked if he could give her a massage or she could watch him shower she recalled in an interview. How do I get out of the room as fast as possible without alienating Harvey Weinstein? Miss Judd said she remembers thinking. In 2014, Mr. Weinstein invited Emily Nestor, who had worked just one day as a temporary employee, to the same hotel and made another offer. If she accepted his sexual advances, he would boost her career. The following year, once again at the Peninsula, a female assistant said Mr. Weinstein badgered her into giving him a massage while he was naked, leaving her crying and very distraught, wrote a colleague, Lauren O'Connor, in a searing memo asserting sexual harassment and other misconduct by their boss. So that was the start of what became, a, the Me Too name was already out there, yeah. but the Me Too movement really took off after the publication of your story. And, and the series of stories that you did. Um, when you published, did you have a notion that it was gonna be as big a deal as it became? Uh, no, uh, short answer is no. And in fact, a couple nights before, as we were working around the clock to finish the story, Jody and I had shared um, a taxi home from the newsroom, it was so late at night, we didn't want to take the subway back, so we're sharing a kind of quiet cab ride through the 
you know, pretty quiet streets of New York and back to Brooklyn, uh, and to get a couple hours of sleep before you go back to the newsroom, uh, which I'm sure many of you guys can relate to. And so I, I turned to her in that moment and I said, do you think anybody is gonna read this story? <laughs> because the truth is, is when you get, when you start working on an investigation, I mean, there's a couple different phases of it. You know, phase one is, is there a story there? Which took us not that long. I mean, sort of three or four or five weeks of reporting, maybe reporting to realize, oh yeah, there's a story here. And it turned out to be much bigger than we could have ever imagined. Um, and then you're trying to figure out, okay, we know there's a story, but are we gonna be able to publish it? Um, are we gonna get to the point where we've been able to obtain enough evidence to, to publish? And you know, Dean Bacay was very explicit with us. You know, we weren't allowed to use anonymous sources. He wasn't gonna allow us to have, he wasn't gonna allow women to make allegations against Weinstein uh, without using their names. And so even as we talked to more and more actresses and more women who, and more and more women who had gone to work for him as assistants or junior executives in his companies, and they were all telling us these like eerily similar, very troubling stories of uh, sexual misconduct and, and assault. Um, you know, none of them were prepared to go on the record for months and months and months. And then we also knew that there were these settlements that he had actually legally, um, you know, sort of strangled through these settlements women into silence, that there was a whole, that there were many women um, who were legally prohibited from speaking to us. And so there's also another very true to life moment in the film where our editor, immediate editor Rebecca Corbett sat us down months into the reporting and said, you know, you guys, uh, okay, what do you got? And we spelled out, you know, we've got this pattern of behavior. We know there's this trail of like payments that were made to silent peop silence people. And she said, okay, is anybody on the record? And we said, no. And she said, do you have any documentation of those settlements? And we were like, no. And she said, you do not have a publishable story. So ultimately we were able to get it on the record. You know, ultimately we were able to like scale that second hurdle where we're like, okay, we see the story, we've got enough evidence, women have gone on the record, we've got documentations of these settlements. But then you come to the question of, is anybody gonna care? I mean, at that point you are convinced that this is extremely important, we wouldn't have been working this hard but we couldn't be sure what the public reaction has been. And I've had different predictions on stories, like what, what kind of impact it's gonna have and been wrong. And so, but we could feel it almost immediately. Our phones and our emails were flooded with other women coming forward with their own stories of abuse and harassment, not just, you know, not just in Hollywood, but in all different professions. Yeah, and that, that part of the book reminded me of that scene in the Spotlight movie where the day the yes. story publishes, the phones are ringing off the hook, they have to bring in extra people. Yeah. It just amazed me that the way you described the flood of calls that were coming in. And these are people, these aren't, you know, calling with some, you know, the worst moment in their lives yeah. to talk about it. And you also had been up, it, other reporters had gotten somewhat close, like great reporters, right? Mm -hmm. David Carr, mm -hmm. Ken Oletta. Yeah. Um, you also knew there was some competition oh, on yeah. the story yeah, too. Oh yeah, that's right, yes. Yeah, tell us a little bit about yeah, that part so, of it. So that's right, so I mean, we would, there was a point where we had, you know, ultimately in October of 2017, after about four or five months of reporting, we went to publish, you know, which was ultimately like a 3,000 word story. You know, this wasn't a long series, it was a 3,000 word story. It was that moment of like, okay, we gotta go with what we got. <laughs> and at that point we had like timelines of all, you know, so, so many allegations um, of like really serious uh, wrongdoing. We had, we were aware of even more settlements. Um, but at that point we also knew that Ronan Farrow was on our trail. And we heard from, I don't know if this has happened to any of you guys, where you're like, you know, you're on a story and you're working sources. And then the source is like, you know who called me the other day? You know who's now, and in this case it was, we knew the, he, we thought he had been at NBC, and then one of our sources said, I got a call from a fact checker at the New Yorker. And it was like, oh my goodness, okay, step on the gas. And, and you know, a story that would have probably, we would have allowed ourselves you know, it, many more weeks to, to complete so we could have done it, it, you know, made it even bigger and been able to go with more, you know, we ultimately knew this much and we published this much. And so, but of course, I mean, what was incredible about this story is that there was, it was so big and so massive that even with 
you know, Ronan at the New Yorker and us continuing to report, you know, so much kept, it just, we, we got different pieces of the, the elephant and just the, the, the pieces of the puzzle just kept coming together. Yeah, those two stories are really, uh, they, they, what, they pair well together. Yeah. The one doesn't make the other one seem old at all. Yeah. L let's take a step back in time, okay, from this sure. high point, this high moment, and this important moment in journalism uh, to sort of your career track, like how did you get to this moment? And um, you grew up in, in Evanston, went to ETHS. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you can see me, I'm wearing an ETH, in the movie there's a point where I, like, I'm wearing an ETHS, well, Carrie, the uh, Carrie Mulligan is wearing an, e an now, Evanston t-shirt. Yeah, as a, somebody who sent their kids to ETHS, that was like the high point of the movie. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> yeah, there was a moment where Carrie was like, I'm, wearing, I'm gonna wear the Evanston <laughs> shirt. I was like, yes! Yeah, that was great. But so at Georgetown University, Tribune yeah. was, I don't think your first job, but No, but yeah, I worked first... at the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel right, down right. the road for four years, right. had a really good experience there. And at the Tribune is where you started to come into the, I mean, you've always no doubt had the investigative instinct, but at the Tribune, you really were jumping in, and, and whether it was authorized by the big bosses or not, yeah. you basically you were a full-time investigative reporter. Right. How did you swing that? With, with, with that an investigative <laughs> team at the, time, at the at the Chicago Tribune. No, that's right. I mean, I think that um, you know from the get-go. I, I mean, listen, I was hooked on journalism the moment I, I I didn't I didn't study journalism in college. I didn't. I honestly didn't really work on my high school or college newspapers, but. When I started working in journalism after I graduated from college, I, I very quickly got hooked. And I think that there are many of us who go into this business because we, for, for idealistic reasons, I mean, we don't want to just kind of report the news of the day, but we hope that we really believe in the power of the fourth estate to hold uh, the powerful to account and to uh, help bring about change and to help bring to light problems and wrongdoing and injustice. And so, I, you know, even as I took on a variety of jobs, I mean, I worked at the English language newspaper in Moscow, the Moscow Times. I worked at, uh, I, I, you know, I worked at the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel as starting off as a general assignment reporter in the Racine County Bureau. When I first came here, I was working in the Schaumb Schaumburg Bureau, you know, doing that kind of traditional trying to work, you know, work your way out of the suburbs into the main newsroom. And so I was uh, obviously, and it was great. I mean, it, to, to have to cover so many different things, uh, I think was like really helped my reporting and my writing skills to have to report, like be thrown at you know, a bunch of different stories and have to rise to the occasion and deliver a story at the end of the day. But ultimately I also was always interested in gravitating towards digging deeper, not just into what the day's news was, but okay, you know, there's a woman who's been shot uh, by her ex-boyfriend in a suburban, you know, in one of the suburbs of Chicago, uh, there was a, a, a gruesome murder of a woman by her ex-boyfriend um, who had been stalking her. And that was a story that, obviously there was the day's news of that, but that was also a moment where the Chicago Tribune said, okay, how did this happen? Um, it turns out this woman had gone to the authorities. She had gotten orders of protection. She had done sort of everything right to try to keep herself safe from this abusive ex-boyfriend, and it didn't work. And that led to actually one of my first investigative efforts at the, t at the Chicago Tribune with other reporters um, trying to figure out how is it that the criminal justice system is failing victims of domestic violence. And from there, you know, that led to sort of more reporting on stalking and ultimately on sex crimes. And so uh, there are kind of a couple degrees of separation from some of these issues. And so at every turn, I just kept digging and digging and digging. And, you know, once you work on stories that make an impact that help send doctors to, you know, sex abusing doctors to jail or help bring rape kits out of evidence and change the laws, there's sort of no looking back. I mean, to me, it was like, how could I just keep doing more and more and more of this? And when you went to Reuters after the Tribune, you did, I don't know how long, you, you and a I- A lot. Yeah, we were at the Tribune together for a while. We were then at Reuters together. We did uh, hazardous environment training, if you might remember. We got, oh, yes. we got thrown in trunks of cars with hoods on it. Right. Uh, <laughs> so, um, but in any event, Reuters, you did a, um, 
uh, a really powerful investigation, months long, uh, on re what was politely called rehoming. Right. Um, that story, I don't know if any other story you had done until then had the national reach and impact that that one did, but that was a, one of the most powerful stories that I, I think I've seen under your byline. Yeah, thank you so much. That was the first time when I made the, the, you know, so I was doing local investigative reporting at the Chicago Tribune looking at city and state issues and then when, without being an investigative reporter, um, but when I went to Reuters, I was working on an investigations team and where I was able to take, in that case, I took more than a year to do that investigation and that was something that obviously stretched across international borders. Um, this black market in adopted kids where people would adopt kids from foreign countries and realize that they came with emotional or behavioral issues that they hadn't known about and didn't want them anymore. And so there was this underground network where people would basically post on websites, these you know, Facebook groups and other online chat rooms, uh, advertisements for adopted kids that they didn't were trying to get rid of. And it was called rehoming, which is a term first used by it, you may probably know it as a term that's used by people who are trying to find new homes for their pets. Uh, and the ads read very much like that. Um, and it was really, it, there was, and it was one of those, it, obviously extremely disturbing and also very ripe for investigation because it was completely unregulated, it was happening underground. And even child welfare agents, nobody knew about it. There was no coverage of it. It wasn't like you were finding the clips that had been done before. So that was also part of what took so long, is that we were really starting from zero and trying to kind of piece together this black market, which really put kids at risk. And, and also following the pattern, the, the interviewing that you needed to do in that story, besides what was substantial data analysis, the interviewing, you, you had both the parents on both sides of yeah. some of these, Adoptions plus the children involved. Yeah. And those had to be incredibly difficult interviews to yeah. accomplish. Oh my goodness. Some of those, I mean, the interviews of the children, and, and in some cases we suspected that the kids were being, um, had very good you know, reason to believe that the kids were being abused by the people. I mean, this was, this was sort of a predator's dream come true. You know, you could take a kid, um, you could take custody of a kid without any oversight. <laughs> Uh, no questions asked, basically, and there were really bad people who were taking advantage of that. And so there were kids who had been brought to this country with the promise of a better life, who were coming out of trauma and orphanages in their home countries, and uh, instead they were basically being handed off to dangerous uh, people who, in some cases, were harming them. And so. I have to say that the interviews, once we started, once I started to be able to track down some of the young people who had been passed along in this way, those were some of the most difficult interviews that I did, especially kids who I suspected had been abused, sexually abused, and um, because how do you, you know, there was just, I had interviewed adults who had been victims of sex crimes, but to talk to kids, to talk to young adults who were so vulnerable um, was really, really challenging. and. But sort of step by step, we did that. And, but to also turn around and talk to the parents, some of these folks who had taken the kids and given them away, to give them a chance to try to explain themselves. Then um, you moved to the New York Times. And um, your more memorable story before you took on the Weinstein Project was some reporting about a guy named Donald Trump yeah. and, um, and his relationship with women. And you did a story before the uh, Access Hollywood tape and a story yeah. after the Access Hollywood tape. I'm curious, um, what's he like to deal with when you're doing a story that he perceives <laughs> as being uh, not very positive? Yeah, well, another, another true-to-life scene in the movie is uh, the, the, you know, the movie starts when, um, you know, as my, when my character is finishing up reporting on then-candidate Donald Trump. It was actually the second story that I did at the Times was that you know the editors said, "Listen, you know, let's get let's let, let's let's dig into this guy's treatment of women." He said some he's he's made comments and there's some headlines from over the years that suggest that you know some questionable beha behavior on his part. Let's do some real digging and see what we can find. And so I worked with my colleague Michael Barbaro, who's now host of the Daily uh, Podcast, and. 
And yeah, and we did it, you know, we did it, we did, we, we reported from some of the first, um, you know, allegations of sexual misconduct against him, and then came back after the Access Hollywood tape with even more serious allegations against him, and so the, the, there's a scene in the movie where I'm, I, 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 of course, once again, to go back to fairness, right, we're preparing to publish this story with these serious allegations against him, and I have to call his campaign and say, you know, can, you know, can Mr., we need comment from Mr. Trump, we're gonna be publishing these allegations. And I expected to get, a call, you know, I expected his PR person, Hope Hicks, to come back with like some, you know, he denies these allegations, period, and that's the end of it. But instead, my phone rings, and um, the person is saying, I've got candidate, you know, I've got Mr. Trump on the phone for you, and so he gets on the phone, and so I'm talking to him directly, and I'm sharing these allegations with him, and he's at first just kind of politely denying them, but then getting more and more forceful, and eventually starting, you know, saying these women are liars, um, the, you know, the, the, the New York Times is out to get me, I'm gonna sue the New York Times, and, you, and then it turns directly, the attacks turned towards me um, individually, and you know, I was just working to stay calm and going on to the next, taking, <laughs> you know, taking notes as frantically as possible, because I'm like, this is the comment, um, and, and, uh, and so I'm just trying, and coming back at him, so even as he's like becoming more belligerent and going harder and harder at me, I still have to say, okay, well, what about the Access Hollywood tape? Did you do those things that you say? <laughs> And uh, so eventually he just screamed at me and said, you know, you're, you're disgusting, you're a disgusting human being, and, uh, you know, hung up the phone, and I just, <laughs> it was my first experience talking to him directly, and it was, um, but I got the comment, so yeah, most good, importantly. Good, yeah. <laughs> so, so, and in some ways it was good preparation for Weinstein, you know, the same yeah. kind of like, let, let me do a bunch of somersaults and um, just sort of throw wall uh, and see if I can kind of slither out of right. this that way and to just maintain your composure right. in those interviews. So let's go back to the Weinstein investigation because we're going to run out of time. Yeah. Um, and um, tell us, it, it's got to be difficult to work in partnership with somebody in a story as complicated as that. Um, uh, or I, I, I guess the upside is you've got two of you yeah. and there's a division of labor and if everything works out things you can get more done, which seem to have been the case. Tell, tell us about how you worked that out with Jody and the division of labor yeah. and, and, and how, how effective it was. Yeah, well, I would say that actually it wasn't until I came to the Times that I actually started working in partnership very regularly. Um, mm. I think that there is an, and I think that there is, an, and I, I've done a lot of investigations on my own, and I feel like I've done them successfully, but I think that there's, and I think, it's, I think it's true, I think there's a recognition that it, when you're taking on really big investigations that it really can be hard to accomplish that on your own, I mean, at least in a timely way, and that if you wanna try to get, you know, get a good story and get it, get it in a timely manner, um, it makes sense to combine forces. And so when I was on maternity leave, I'd reported on Trump up until I'd gone on maternity leave, and so, uh, while I was uh, while I was gone, Jody had started the Weinstein investigation, and she was actually having a hard time getting women to talk, at least to talk on the record. And she was, and we didn't know each other, but she knew that I had done reporting. I'd worked with women. I'd reported on women who had made these allegations against Trump, and that I had also done reporting, a lot of reporting here in Chicago on women who had been victims of sex crimes. And so she called me up on maternity leave and said you know, what should I do here? Like when I knock on these doors or when I pick up the phone and I've got what could very well be 30 seconds uh, to make a case to talk to me, what should I say? And, you know, I was happy to, to have the conversation. I was happy to get the phone call and I, happy to be able to share with her, you know, my experience, which was, to, you know, a case that I had made over and over again, which was like, listen, I can't change what's happened to you in the past, but if you work with me, me on this story, we might be able to help protect other people. And, you know, we might be able to make a difference and put your pain to some, you know, productive use. And so that was really the kind of beginning, the, yeah, in, in, in some ways that was the beginning of our partnership, that exchange we had. 
But when I came back from maternity leave, she wanted me to join her on the story, but there were some other folks who wanted me to go return to covering Trump, and so I had this kind of push and pull. And I wasn't sure, I have to, I mean, I, I, will, I will confess that doing some of that Trump coverage in, during the um, during the election in 2016 left me a little bruised and battered. I mean, that was a far cry from the Harvey Weinstein reporting. I mean, the women that I reported on, you know, he publicly attacked, he threatened to sue us. Um, it was, I mean, reporting into a political realm is totally different, and obviously he became a political figure like none, none other that had, you know, been elected to the White House. And so it just felt like the, the, the kind of there was a shift in what journalism could accomplish. You could start to feel that not only that the country was so polarized and just becoming more and more polarized, but that, and that there wasn't an agreement on facts anymore. These facts that we like, you know, cherished and felt like, okay, well, if we can go out and find the facts and we can publish them, then there's going to be a response and, and it's going to make a difference. And, and this felt like it, that was shifting. And so I was kind of losing faith, honestly, in the power of journalism. And I wasn't sure what I wanted to do. And what, one thing that's interesting apropos of that is that in the project with Jody, your role it ended up, you dug up a lot of documents and mm -hmm. emails, mm -hmm. and you, I think, got the tip that there were eight settlements, which mm -hmm. you were able to nail down. And you really, even though you have this expertise in listening comment from people on sensitive topics, you also were doing some really dig, digging into the, the proofs that Dean Becquet was demanding of you. That's right, and and I would say you know also there were um, or yeah Rebecca. there yeah. were there were different, and I think that there was a part of me who had, and listen, I was also had a baby at home, so Jody did more of the sort of traveling Travel. out into the world to <laughs> to see you know to meet with some of the 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 women uh, face to face and had some tremendous breakthroughs. I think. That was, I think that one of the things about our partnership, and partnerships can work a, you know, a variety of ways, but I think that we were both very committed to this investigation, and once I jumped in, um, and we had some similar skill sets, but also some different ones. I think she uh, had the emotional capacity to you know, in, have some of these like very long conversations and, and have form some in-depth relationships with some of the sources, including some of the women who ultimately went on the record. And I had, I mean, in terms of the digging up and then working some of the bad guys, you know, like yeah. there were people in Weinstein's, you know, there were some of these, the, 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 there, were, there were his, you know, Lanny Davis, his crisis PR guy well, ended up giving us a ton of information. And um, I, I guess that, there, you know, we always say, Jody and I are sometimes asked, like, okay, if we you know, if, if we weren't journalists, what would we want to do? And I think, you know, she has said that she'd, you know, welcome the chance to kind of be a therapist of some sort. And I've said that I'd welcome the chance to be like a, a detective or a prosecutor of some sort. Because, <laughs> you know, when a Harvey Weinstein barges into the New York Times, I welcome the chance to, I mean, I, I, I sort of, I like that. I mean, I yeah, like kind you of, like the uh, <laughs> you like the I like that part. I like yeah. the, yeah, and, I, and yeah. I like sort of trying to figure out the people who are kind of complicit. How can you kind of, uh, how can you extract information from right. the subject and the people in his realm? So I want to ask a little bit about post-publication of yeah. your stories, your book, your movie. Um, I don't know if it's your movie, but no, the not, movie. No, not, not really, yeah. uh, but you know, it, it's, it was amazing. She sounds like you, sort of. She did yeah, a great job. Yeah, after. Yeah. Um, have you, have, has your work, the work you've done, had the impact on society today that you thought in the, in the height of things, when the story was blowing up in the way it was, and there were all these additions, the, the Louis C.K. and all the other things that were happening there, um, do you feel that the Me Too movement has stuck and changed society, or have we reverted back to a norm that's less than it appeared it might be at that I point? mean, this, I, I think that the, the Me Too movement has, not surprisingly, uh, turned out to be very, you know, a, a sort of a complicated, evolving uh, movement, uh, and that we, there, there are no sort of clear black and white uh, answers to where things stand today. Uh, I think that we really caution people 
having obviously covered the Weinstein story through his criminal conviction, and you know, there have been other high-profile cases of you know, men who have been convicted or men who have gotten off, and there have been, I think people can mistakenly, we really caution people against doing an assessment, just like a surface assessment of Me Too, especially just based on these big cases. I mean, the real question is, how are things playing out on the ground? How are things playing out in the systems, you know, these, the criminal justice system, in HR departments? And you know, there have been many, many states that have passed new laws to increase protections in the workplace. And there have been other meaningful systemic changes. But it's also clear <laughs> that, this is, uh, that, this is, that this is evolving and that there's, it, you know, it's a mistake to draw firm conclusions. And I think it just continues to be a good story. And I think that reporting into the complications and the nuance is, is really the job of journalists. You, know, you can't stop at the victorious moment when right. the press publish on the Weinstein story. And, and to, follow, to kind of take to the more recent chapter as well, and speaking of a circumstance that's evolving, uh, your coverage and the Times' coverage of transgender issues has drawn attention. Mm -hmm. And uh, the story that you did about puberty blockers uh, was one, uh, not the only one, but, but signif got significant outside attention, mm -hmm. fair amount of criticism from people in the trans mm -hmm. world mm -hmm. um, about the Times, about decisions you made, Tell us why that story needed to be done, and um, what what you take uh, what did you take away from the criticism mm -hmm. yeah. that is uh, elicited? Yeah, it, it was interesting when I was. I mean, I, and I've done other investigations since Weinstein, and uh, I. But when I last year when I started uh, reporting into puberty blockers, this first line of medical treatment for adolescents uh, seeking a medical transition. Um, I, I had people tell me, I mean, this was, we were waiting for the She Said movie to come out. You know, Jody and I had, you know, received a lot of positive public attention over the, you know, the last five years for, uh, for that work. And I, I had people say, you know, why, why are you going to do this? Like, why are you going to go into this, this, you know, completely flammable, um, transgender world um, when you're just guaranteed to come under attack no matter what you do, no matter what you write. And, you know, I really felt like, you know, for me, reporting without fear or favor doesn't just mean that we report, doesn't just mean that you're reporting on, you know, predators <laughs> um, and other kind of powerful Hollywood executives. To me, it also means going into some of the more complicated and, and ferociously divisive issues um, in our country and doing the same kind of, uh, you know, kind of fact-based, accurate, fair reporting that you do with all your subjects. And so, there was no doubt that by last year, you know, the medical treatment of transgender kids had become probably the most the divisive issue in the country, you know, maybe after abortion. And, you know, you had Republicans who were calling it child abuse and seeking to ban it completely. Um, you had activists saying, and, and many medical folks saying that this was, you know, life-saving treatment um, and that kids would die if they didn't get it. And then you also had, as I started to report, like some, you know, it was clear that there was debate within the medical field among the people who were doing this treatment that there wasn't, um, that the science wasn't settled and that there was actual sort of debate and in, in some cases disagreement over, you know, what should be done and, and at what time, you know, it's it, it sort of what age and what the, you know, what the, what the risks and the, what, what were the sort of, what was the knowledge of the risks and benefits? And so we also knew that there were, and I'm sure you guys, I'm sure this is the case in this room, whether it's your own families or friends of your families. I mean, I don't think that there's anybody who doesn't know somebody who's now grappling with these decisions in some way. And so I felt like we had an obligation to cut through the rhetoric um, and the, you know, the sort of the, the political, rhetor political rhetoric and just do old fashioned reporting and try to deliver to families who are sitting in waiting rooms with their you know, 10 or 11 year old and trying to figure out whether or not to use these drugs, what are the facts as best as, as, best as we know at this point? And so, um, 
uh, you know, I didn't, I didn't think twice about doing the, the, the reporting, and, um, but I, I knew that it would come, I mean, I knew that it was gonna likely get attack, uh, come under attack, and it has. It's part of a body of work at the Times that has come under attack. Um, you know, I think that the work that we've done has, uh, you know, I, I'm, you know, just as proud of that work as I am of, of um, all the other reporting I've done. And so I just think that especially now as the, the, the country continues to be so divisive and news organizations, uh, I, I mean, I think we can't, I, I don't think we can shy away from these, these subjects. I think so, it's our duty to report into them. So people in the trans movement have said that, um, trans, not <laughs> movement, I mean, it's a state of, who people are, but uh, activists have said, well, this story is being used uh, to kind of, to cast aspersions on trans people. It's being used as an excuse to ban these procedures, et cetera. Um, does, how do you feel about that critique? Yeah, I mean, I, I have had conversations with, I mean, there was, there have been some, there was sort of a letter that was circulated against my story um, by one of the medical groups, and I called up the person who wrote it, and I said, I want to talk to you about this because I feel like this letter is full of inaccuracies and mischaracterizations. I had that letter, I had that letter up on my computer, and I had my story up, and I wanted to go line by line <laughs> to compare, and this person refused to engage in the content um, and basically said straight up, like, listen, we just don't want any, we don't, I don't want any, we don't want any coverage of this, period. And I said, and because of the fear that it could be used to weaponize, and, and um, you know, I was talking to a colleague of mine, I was talking to an old colleague of mine at Reuters, because Reuters also did a series on, on trans issues, um, medical, the medical treatment and, uh, last year, and so I had a friend of mine who was in town, and we were sort of swapping stories, and she said that they would also get messages saying, you know, we're worried that these stories are gonna be used to dissuade people from care, or, you know, and that the response was always like, we're not reporting to persuade or dissuade. You know, we're just, and I feel like that goes, I mean, we report, um, you know, we just have to report the, I mean, I think if you, if you stop reporting the facts, because people are telling you they're gonna be used for, you know, People are going to try to use this to we weaponize you. Then you're you're you're. That's just a slippery slope. And um. so, la last question, Megan. Um, after all of this body of work of super sensitive, yeah, uh, politically charged reporting that you've done, how are you different as a journalist today than you were back when you were in the Tribune newsroom uh, making those first uh, calls? I mean, I don't think that I'm different at all, actually. <laughs> I mean, I think that, uh, you know, at the end of the day, I felt this way, I mean, I used to, I lived um, uh, in Edgewater, and I used to ride my bike to work to the Chicago Tribune and back, and I remember that spectacular bike ride along the lakefront, and every day I'd just be riding my bike and being like, I can't believe I get to do this work, I can't believe I get to do this work, this is so awesome! And when you, when, you, when you know, you guys know this, when you start to have stories that make impact, um, it's like nothing else. And I think, so I still feel that way. And I, I am still, I mean, I, I, I look back a, a bit on the stories that have come before, but I'm like everybody else, you're only as good as your next story. So it's like, okay, what are we doing tomorrow? And, what's, <laughs> and, and I think that one of the things I wanted to tell you is I was actually, uh, colleagues of mine at the Times who were recently having a conversation, we're all kind of working on various stories where we're trying to figure out how to get people to talk and what the various methods are. And Jody was saying, you know, I've learned about some of the methods of being like really tough uh, from Megan, and I've obviously learned techniques from her. And so we were, we were debating, you know, at what point do you become really tough in, in conversations? And I remember I pointed out that when I, I had my first newspaper job at the Racine County Bureau at the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel. I think in my first annual review, I got a job review. They said, I, my, my editor at the time said I was too aggressive on the phone, <laughs> um, which I promptly ignored. Um, and I re I'll never forget when I came down, from, when I finally got from the, Sch the Schomburg Bureau into the downtown newsroom, I was sitting not far from David and not too far from Jody Cohen, who's here tonight, and Casey 
uh, Atiero, who's here tonight as well. And I remember being tough. I remember you were so tough on the phone, and <laughs> which I loved. And I think you're sort of a legend for that. And uh, I remember kind of showing up and taking my cubicle and starting to do my reporting. And there was one point where you kind of looked over at me, and I, you'd heard me on the phone, and you said, wow, like you're really good and tough on the phone. And I was like, <laughs> yes! <laughs> and so uh, anyway, I've never forgotten that. Well, and great. so it's really such a pleasure to, to be on stage with you. And when you asked uh, if I'd be willing to do this, I'm like, anything, of course. You know, yeah. there's still a part of me that's like, David Grising thinks I'm tough on the phone. <laughs> <laughs> well, you were. I, I remember just watching I mean, watching you work, hearing you work those <laughs> stories. One of the great things about being in that newsroom was the great journalists who were sitting yeah. cheek by jowl, doing that work on the phones a lot. We weren't just emailing all our questions. And there's nothing like going to toe to toe yeah. with the source and getting what you need. Yeah, from and, and you, know, you know, there's, there's, and figuring out when you do that and when right. you don't. There's lots of times where I just sure. am very soft and very, you know, bright eyed and tell me more. This is confusing. <laughs> but um, yeah, no, I think there's no substitute for it. And I know that especially as newsrooms become, you know, people are, are work remotely. Like I just learned so much uh, sitting um, at the Chicago Tribune, uh, you know, shoulder to shoulder with you guys. So it's really nice to be with some of you tonight again. Well, thank you, Megan. Thank you for doing this. Yeah. Thanks very much. Thank you, David and Megan, for that inspiring conversation, reminding us of what journalism can do and that being a little tough isn't always a bad thing. So now on to the main event. Um, as David mentioned earlier, the Richard H. Driehaus Foundation has been funding the BGA and other nonprofit Chicago newsrooms for more than two decades overseeing the foundation's journalism and government accountability portfolio is Nick Burt, the Driehaus Foundation's journalism program officer. Before joining the foundation seven years ago, Nick spent time at the Lloyd Fry Foundation and taught for America. With a journalism degree from Northwestern, University, Medill, Northwestern University's Medill School, he comes by his passion for this work naturally. Before inviting Nick and David Grising back to the stage, we'd like to introduce you to tonight's Driehaus Awards finalists. Please watch as these videos describe the investigations of the eight finalists, four in the large newsroom category, and four more from newsrooms with 10 or few journalists. Here are our finalists. Our investigation found that the Chicago Police Department denied hundreds of U visa applications for undocumented crime victims last year. Many of those denials were at odds with federal certification standards, and some appeared to violate state law. Two Chicago police sergeants who issued most of the denials reviewed by Injustice Watch fatally shot civilians and had serious questions raised by investigators about their credibility. This story came about after years of reporting on immigrant communities here in Chicago. The specific focus on U-Visas came after a source tipped me off to the massive amounts of denials that she'd been seeing over the last few years. This story is important because it shows how undocumented crime victims are often underserved by the police. And it also shows why some immigrant communities are so very wary to come forward. And it also shows how the police can still cause harm even if they're sitting behind a desk. Our investigation found that there really is no effective oversight of pesticide exposure in Illinois. Um, unlike other states, Illinois does not require that doctors report these uh, pesticide exposure events to authorities. So there's really no database or anything like that in the state. Um, in particular, our story focused on this incident in 2019, uh, where dozens of farm workers were exposed, were sprayed by pesticides twice in a matter of two weeks. And a sad component of this is that their children who 
were as young as infants were also exposed to pesticides. This is important because it showed that um, unlike in other states, Illinois does not have a good way to respond to these events. We got involved because there had been some reporting at the time of the incident. There was a lawsuit that came out. There was reporting on that. Um, but we knew that there had to be more, that this had to be indicative of a larger issue. So the story is about a private vendor who provides a little known alcohol monitoring device called a scram bracelet to people who are on probation in Cook County and who have been sentenced by judges to wear it. And what I discovered was that this private vendor was operating without a contract for nearly two years. Uh, probationers themselves have to pay 12 to $24 a day to wear this device. And without a contract, suddenly they were operating completely without any requirements to report anything to the government. The county was in, no longer in a position to know what was happening with this program that they had outsourced. I started reporting on this story first because I became aware of one judge who was responsible for 40% of the SCRAM assignments in Cook County. The big problem is that when people are sentenced in the criminal justice system, they're not supposed to be paying for their own punishment. This represents one version of the way that private vendors make a profit off of criminal punishment. In 2021, Illinois changed the felony murder rule, which allows people who commit certain felonies to be prosecuted for a first degree murder, even if they weren't the ones who directly killed the person. And in our investigation, we wanted to find out who was being affected by this rule and how those who were incarcerated were going to be affected by the reform. Um, the reform was not retroactive, so those individuals will still remain incarcerated, even though the reform now removes the third party felony murder charges. So we had to review all the data to figure out which individuals had been charged with a felony murder charge. We thought this investigation was important to do because those who were incarcerated were going to be left behind for something that they wouldn't be put in prison for today. And what we found in our investigation was that youth were disproportionately impacted by this rule and a lot of their lives were going to be ruined for something that they never committed. Block Club stories revealed how COVID-19 pop-up testing sites provided people in the city and throughout the country with flawed and outright false test results during the height of the Omicron wave when many were desperate for answers and looking to keep each other safe. We looked into the pop-up testing sites because Chicagoans had come to us telling us about bad experiences and results that didn't seem to make sense. We found that these companies received more than $500 million from the federal government for these test results, while their owners bragged online about buying sports cars, mansions, and even items like gold-encased iPhones with, as they put it, COVID money. Our reporting led to people across the nation being able to make more informed choices during a time of literal life and death. It's also led to federal and state investigations. The companies have had to close down and some people are facing charges. The Price Kids Pay is an investigation by the Chicago Tribune and ProPublica that examined how school officials and police had been working together to issue tickets that came with very costly fines to students for minor misbehavior at school. It's a story we came to uh, from previous reporting on seclusion and restraint in Illinois schools where we noticed that police were becoming involved in disciplinary matters and in behavioral interventions. We quickly discovered that police were actually issuing tickets, which is something we hadn't expected, um, for everyday behavior, things like having a vape pen on campus or fights at school. We examined a uh, school for children with disabilities in Jacksonville, Illinois, where staff called the police about student behavior every other school day on average. Students across the state were missing school ending up in municipal courts with fines that could cost hundreds of dollars and land families in debt. The culture of cruelty is about a 
series of instances of abuse and neglect against patients at Shote Mental Health in far southern Illinois. The facility is home to more than 250 people with developmental disabilities and mental illness. This story came about with the arrest of about 12 people over a course of just a couple years in 2019 and 2020, including three top administrators. It's very unusual for administrators to be charged. So we decided to take a deeper dive into the um, abuse and neglect at the facility. We found that over the course of just about six years that there had been 50 arrests at that facility. Both the staff arrested for abusing patients as well as patients who were arrested for what were relatively minor abuses on staff. This project is important because these facilities are home to some of the state's most vulnerable citizens. We wanted to look and see what were the root causes of what was going on that was leading to these arrests and why this had been allowed to fester up to this point. The investigation, DCFS survivors, started actually in 2019. So we've been following the lives of 14 DCFS survivors for the last four years. What we did is we obtained and fought for a database from DCFS, the Department of Children and Family Services, and we got 20 years of data involving every foster child, every foster parent that had ever been in care. We were able to crunch that data and we were able to decipher that 90% of the time when a foster care child, a kid in the system, made an allegation of abuse or neglect, it went unfounded. They did not make a finding against the foster parents. So 90% of the time, every time a kid made an allegation or a doctor or a mandated reporter at school, nobody was held accountable. We wanted to see what the outcomes were in all the cases that were coming in. Were people actually getting criminally investigated? and they told us they didn't keep track. Hey everybody, good to see you all here tonight. And thank you to all of our finalists and to everyone who submitted to this year's competition. Um, I understand that we had more than 30 submissions this year coming from newsrooms all over the state. The work we've just seen is a testament to the power of investigative journalism and a reminder of why our founder, Richard Driehaus, loved this award. Each year, it's the foundation's honor to recognize the top achievements in investigative journalism throughout the state of Illinois. Together, our finalists and winners are uncovering problems, holding powerful institutions accountable, and helping the public more deeply understand the issues of our time. I'm delighted to be with you tonight to present the awards. Let's start with the small newsroom category. This year's runner-up is Sky Chatty and Amanda Perez Pintado of Investigate Midwest for how Illinois' fragmented system of pesticide monitoring exposure allows individuals to get poisoned over and over without any breaks. That's a long title, but a deserving work. Investigate Midwest, please join me on the stage to receive your award. Okay, and this, this year's first place award goes to Maya Dugmasova of Injustice Watch for her investigation of scram devices. I really didn't expect to win. Thank you so much. Um, I really appreciate the recognition for this work. Um, most of all, I'm really proud of the fact that uh, I was joined by two Injustice Watch, uh, well, three Injustice Watch colleagues um, as a finalist. Um, it's really an honor, and I'm really proud of the work that our small investi investigative newsroom um, is doing. So um, I really appreciate this very much, and um, 
I guess uh, most of all, I'm grateful to the people who were willing to talk to me for um, this cycle of stories, uh, the people who were um, sentenced to wear SCRAM monitors, um, people who worked for county government who knew something was wrong with this contracting issue. Um, I appreciate that trust um, and faith they had in, in, in Justice Watch and in my, my reporting. And um, yeah, thank you so much. I, I really appreciate the recognition. Okay, in the large newsroom category, I am delighted to present the runner-up award to Dave Savini and Michelle Youngerman of CBS2 for their investigation, DCFS Survivors. This year's first place in the large newsroom category goes to Jody S. Cohen and Jennifer Smith Richards of the Chicago Tribune and ProPublica. Okay, uh, thank you so much to the Driehaus Foundation, the BGA, and uh, thank you to our editors, George Papajohn and Steve Mills and Karen Tissue and Mitch Pugh. Um, thank you to my reporting partner, Jennifer. Um, and thank you to all the families and the young people who spoke with us uh, to, you know, so that we could do this work. Um, Amara and Gabe and Nathan and Blake and so many young people who selflessly shared their stories with us. So thank you. Thanks for the recognition, truly. And ask us anything about those stories that the kids told us. We will talk endlessly about that. Um, but I also just want to say, you know, thank you to those of you who are doing this work. Thank you to those of you who are funding this work and care about it. Um, please don't stop. We need it now more than ever. So thank you. Thank you. All right, for everybody, please join me one more time in congratulating this year's award winners. What an inspiring group of honorees. Thank you very much. And thank you to everybody who submitted to this uh, really intense competition. Um, the BGA doesn't judge the awards. We facilitate the judging of the awards. Uh, but I can tell you this year, the the judges had a really hard job and uh, were really inspired by the work everybody did.